Houghton, and uh, we hope you enjoyed the last couple of broadcasts we've had. This is our third uh, video broadcast here on CMRI.TV. The first broadcast I hope you were able to check out because it uh, was a very wonderful herb walk that we did last year at the Hour of the Time Skills and Research Conference in Eager, Arizona. And that was hosted by, uh, at least the herb walk was hosted by David Christopher from the School of Natural Healing. And uh, he will be at the conference once again this year. He's a wonderful speaker, uh, very entertaining, very informative. Uh, we hope you can uh, pop by the conference this year and check him out. Now, if you'd like to go and check out the conference schedule, you can do so by checking out our website at www hourofthetime.com and uh, just poke your nose around there, go to the conference 2007 page and you'll be able to find out all the details on the conference, plus uh, check out our podcasts, audio podcasts and uh, other things like that. Now last week here on CMRI.TV we showed you the special tribute that the conference attendees did last year at Bill's gravesite. Of course just after Bill was murdered in 2001, uh, Doyle put out a plea to have uh, people from across America and the world basically to send in uh, stones and precious uh, <clears throat> stones and things like that from uh, their local territories. So we had boxes and boxes and boxes of stones sent in from all over America. Uh, you can see those placed at the gravesite uh, of Bill Cooper. We built his gravesite memorial last year. We hope you enjoyed that presentation. And for this presentation today, we thought we would go way back it to, uh, I believe, 1989 when Bill did a speech in Sedona, Arizona. Now this is one of Bill's most famous speeches. The people that had seen this speech uh, claim it to be one of Bill's most important speeches. Of course it was shortly before uh, Behold a Pale Horse was published in 1991. So uh, you'll get to see Bill's ideas in the early years. Now of course you know that he changed some of his beliefs about UFOs and aliens throughout the years. Uh, but it's interesting to watch this uh, historical footage from 1989 and we hope that you'll enjoy it. If you'd like to contact us here at the Hour of the Time, you may do so by going to our website, hourofthetime.com, or if you'd like to write to us via snail mail, you may do so by writing HOT, P.O. Box 940, Eager, spelled E-A-G-A-R, in the state of Arizona, and the zip code is 85925. You may write directly to me, Robert Houghton, at webmaster at hourofthetime.com, or if you'd like to get in touch with the regular show host, uh, Doyle Shamley, he can be contacted at hourofthetime at hotmail.com. Thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you enjoy this presentation. Bill Cooper, Sedona, Arizona. Thank you. I'm here tonight to bring you some revelations, so to speak. We've been asleep for many, many years, and it's time now for us to wake up. And it's time for us to wake up not in fright, not to look around and jump back from the shadows, but to come awake with our eyes open, realizing what stands in front of us and what we must do so that we can live our lives again in peace and trans tranquility. And we must, at all costs, guard against drifting back into the slumber that we have been in for the last 40 to 50 years that has really created the situation that we find ourselves in today. We're going to be discussing a lot of subjects tonight and I would like for you to hold your questions until the end at which time I will be happy to answer them. The harder the question, the more I like it. There's no such thing as a dumb or stupid question and while I'm imparting this information to you tonight, I want you to try to come up with questions to poke holes in it. And I'm going to answer every one of those questions because when you leave here tonight, 
I don't want you to have any doubts in your mind whatsoever about the truthfulness of what you're about to hear. Because it is so important not only that you understand it and believe it, but that you act upon it so that we can do something about it. <coughs> we tried to get a large television set tonight, and lo and behold, in the entire city of Sedona, this is the largest we could get. <laughs> so if you'll bear with us, I'm going to be showing you some videotapes. Most of them we're going to play through once, because the audio will be enough for those of you who aren't able to see it from the back. When I get to the Kennedy tape, if you are unable to see what you need to see, after we play it the first time, let me know. We will then ask the people in the front to stand up and move back, and those of you in the back come forward. We will play it through as many times as we need to. It is important that you know that you've been lied to, that your own government assassinated one of our presidents. And we're going to show that to you tonight. I would like to thank uh, some people now and talk about some material that you're going to be seeing here in the future. <clears throat> I would like to thank especially Eve Bruce, who through long distance <coughs> telephone conversations uh, really started this rolling and was the one who put it together for you. I would like to also thank uh, Mr. Ed DeMar, who uh, was sort of in partnership with Eve to bring this about and did an awful lot of work on it, and who has written a book called Laissez Majesty. Uh, it's by Ed DeMar, and it covers or concerns a lot of the material that I'm going to discuss tonight, and a lot of the things that Colonel Bo uh, James Bo Greitz is talking about across the nation. I have read a good portion of Mr. DeMar's book this morning, and I have to tell you it is one of the most in-depth, most well-researched, most well-referenced works of its kind that I have seen and includes the best bibliography on the subject which is available for all of you here tonight. You can pick up this bibliography from the table back here and the reason we put it out for you to pick up is because most of what I'm going to tell you tonight you can find out for yourselves through your own research. Most of the information that I'm going to give you is not secret. It has been in the public domain for many years. However, we have been extremely, trying to think of a nice word for it, but I can't. The word is really negligent, uh, asleep. We have abdicated our role as the watchdogs of our government. Instead of reading, instead of questioning, we watch television. We believe everything that Dan Rather tells us. <laughs> amongst others. He is just one. There are many, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that later, who lie to you every night on the 6 o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news. So that we get started off on the right foot, I'd like to preface my talk with something I think you need to hear to put you in the proper frame of mind and keep you, I hope, from becoming afraid. Fear is a worse enemy than any other thing that we have to face. Ladies and gentlemen, the world needs to hear the truth. It's long overdue. The world also needs more peace, compassion, and cooperation. We already have too much fear and confusion. And too many people are feeling hopeless and victimized. What is offered here is startling information. 
And what we ask is that if you choose to accept it, you do so with the understanding that it would not come to our attention now if we did not have the ability to successfully respond. But successful only if we bring our highest thoughts, energies, and feelings to take positive action. We are not here to create more confusion, fear, or negative energies of any kind. And it is important that we not give in to these in ourselves, as it would only add to what the world already has. Fearing and fighting is the old way. We've tried to change the world, and the result has been that those who managed to be the victors brought the same constrictive and negative patterns back into power. We have now come to the threshold of a new understanding, that we must fight fear with confidence, hatred with love, separateness with unity, and beliefs of being a helpless victim with the acknowledgement and acceptance of the power we have to create our own lives and then the world. It can only go in that order. For if we are still creating confusion and negativity in our own experience, we can only contribute that to the world. We can change the world, but it will not be by outward action alone. To the extent we can bring truthfulness, compassion, and peace in our own lives is the exact extent to which we will bring them into the world. <coughs> this does not mean that we have to sit in our rooms until we perfect our own lives, but to realize that if we see ourselves as victims, we will be victimized. If we perceive part of the world as separate, wrong, or evil, that is exactly what we will have. <coughs> this story was beautifully played out in Star Wars. Luke had to gain his own inner power first by his belief in his connectedness with all things, and could only succeed in battle by not giving in to negative feelings. The problems that have arisen in our world have come as a reflection of our own collective fears, beliefs in separateness, and refusal to accept our own power and responsibility for the events in our lives. If we give in, to these same feelings again. The battle will be lost before it is begun. Now I want you to bear that in mind. And I want you to bear in mind that what has happened over the years, we bear a major part or portion of the responsibility. It is up to us in the abdication of others to correct the situation, to correct it. We are powerful. Each and every one of us is worthy, is powerful, has great potential to change the world. If you look back through history, you will find at least 27 incidences that I can pinpoint where one man or one woman has changed the entire world. If you doubt your ability to successfully act and change the world, I challenge you to re-examine that belief and I challenge you to stand up, take action, and I guarantee you that you will be amazed at the power that you really, really have. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm talking about tonight began many years ago, 250 years ago to be exact. This is not something that has happened overnight. This is not something that's going to go away overnight. But it is something that we can begin to work on. And we can make, we can make major changes before the end of this year. 
and before the night is over, that is going to be my challenge to you and my commission to you is to help us bring about those changes. And I'll tell you exactly what those are. <coughs> I'm going to brush over the brief history of this because what I want to do is get to the meat of, mat meat of the matter uh, that's happening today because that's really what concerns us. But you need to know how it all started. About 250 years ago, there was a man who was contacted by, you might call it a channel, you might call it an alien being, you might call it a spirit, whatever you call it, this entity that contacted this person set in motion one of the most far-reaching, longest-lasting conspiracies known to man. It began with the Illuminati. It began with the Illuminati right from the inception of the Illuminati as a plot to depose the rulers of the countries of the world, take down the national barriers, create a one-world government, with the core members or executive members of the Illuminati at its head, concentrating the power of the world and the wealth of the world in their hands and subjugating the rest of the human race literally to serfdom. When the heads of the monarchs of the countries of Europe uncovered this plot accidentally, they immediately banned the Illuminati. They put a price on the head of the members of the Illuminati and they quickly disappeared and took to the holes in the ground. They were sheltered by other secret groups. You will find that all of the secret societies that are concerned with this particular conspiracy all through the years always have levels of initiation for their membership. I'll explain to you why that is a little bit later. This is really a European thing, but it has spread to the United States. The major controlling membership of these secret societies is a group known as the Round Table of Nine. They are the heads of the most powerful banking families in the world. When you get right down to it, there are only nine families who control the wealth of the world, and that is the nine families whose heads make up the round table of nine. Beneath the round table of nine, there's an international organization known as the Bilderbergers. The Bilderbergers are a major player in this. Beneath the Bilderbergers, each nation has its own group. Most of the European nations look to the Club of Rome. In the United States, it's the Council on Foreign Relations. And in recent years, in our generation, the Trilateral Commission. You may not realize this, but they are one and the same. The Trilateral Commission branched off from the Council on Foreign Relations to give you something to hang on to should they lose political power. It is an old ploy. It's the same as in the playoffs for Major League Football. You have two teams and you play yourself. You cannot lose. That is the theory behind the split. Now that you know a little bit of the history, and not too much because I really want you to go start reading for yourself, and you will find that there's plenty of material to give you food for thought, a lot of hours of reading, uh, and a lot of productive research. Our story really started in around 1936 when Germany recovered a flying disc. It is not clear whether they entered into an agreement with the aliens and were given the disc, or whether they took the disc, or whether the disc crashed and they just came in possession of it. 
the method by which they did this is not clear. It is clear, however, that they had a disk as early as 1936, that they were attempting to duplicate the technology in an area known as Pinamunde. When we went into that area after World War II, excuse me, and captured Pinamunde, we found safes, file cabinets, drawers loaded with documents on the alien technology and on the attempts to reproduce the technology. We found pieces and portions of hardware. We found some of the scientists in our sweep trying to recover them. Many of them, however, were captured by the Russians. Much of the hardware was also captured by the Russians, and the Russians may have captured the original disk, because we certainly didn't get it to my knowledge. Notice I say to my knowledge, because I was not privy to every scrap of information. When we found this, at the close of World War II, we were extremely concerned. We didn't know what to do about it, but we immediately set the scientists about working on trying to duplicate the technology or at least come up with it on our own. Most of it we did not have to duplicate until 1947, when, as you've probably read or heard, or recently if you watched Unsolved Mysteries uh, last Wednesday on television, uh, you saw what was described as the Roswell incident. The Roswell incident is a true incident. It did occur. It occurred near the city of Roswell, New Mexico. And what actually happened, there was a thunderstorm. A disc was seen flying over two cities in the direction where the wreckage was found. The disc either exploded in the air or hit something in the air. But whatever happened, we know it happened in the air because debris was found in two different locations. There were large amounts of small debris, uh, debris uh, scattered over a ranch that belonged to a Mr. Brazel who was an old-time cowboy. He was a very honest man and reported it. Several miles away, there was a large, intact majority of the saucer, actually, or the disk, found on the ground with several dead alien bodies. The reason I say several is there are accounts that there were four. I saw pictures of three of those dead alien bodies in a report called Project Grudge, which also included material from a report called Blue Book, report number 13. So, I'm not sure whether there were three or four. I saw photographs of three of those bodies for sure. Really, it doesn't make any difference if there was one or 50. The important thing is that it occurred and that there were dead alien bodies that were not of this world. The technology was not of this world. We could find nothing within that craft that we knew anything about. We could not find electrical wires. We could not find vacuum tubes. We could not find hydraulic actuators, accumulators, uh, control valves. We didn't know what made this thing tick. Immediately, uh, it was classified secret. It was carted away. The press was told, first, that they had recovered a flying saucer. Second, that no, it wasn't a flying saucer, it was a weather balloon. When the local newspaper tried to put it out on the wire, the wire service was interrupted, and a message came across the wire to the local news service stating that they were to cease transmission immediately. What they were transmitting concerned the national security. The message was from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And this is documented. The witnesses are still alive and have so testified to this fact. What happened over the next several years, really that's the most important thing that initially happened. The second most important thing that happened, and there were, there were other crashes in between, the second most important thing that happened is that we found two disks in the vicinity of Aztec, New Mexico in 1948 which contained 
human body parts. Now, this caused the classification to go from secret to way above top secret because there was a great fear of a national panic. Now, this was before they ever did a study to determine whether or not they believed the populace would panic if the information that aliens here were here uh, was disseminated. But they knew that if they told the public or if it got out to the public by some means that aliens were not only here but were flying around in craft which contained human body parts, that's another story altogether. Now, I don't want you to get real concerned about this because your chances of being affected by it personally are extremely remote. The next really important occurrence was the fact that in 1949, again near Roswell, two discs crashed. They recovered five alien bodies from these discs and in combing the area to make sure that they had recovered all of the wreckage and everything that they could so that the public would not be able to discover anything and so that they would have everything with which to gain knowledge and technology from, they scoured the area by foot patrol, by jeep patrol, and by aircraft reconnaissance and discovered an alien live from the crash wandering in the desert. They captured him. He was designated EB, Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. EB was taken to Los Alamos where he was placed in a Faraday shielded environment because he had the ability to read the thoughts and transmit thoughts to people outside of where he was being held captive. He also had the ability through a device that he wore around his waist to literally walk through walls. Now, we know through our own study of science that this is not far-fetched. We know that mass or matter is made up of molecules which are made up of atoms. And in between these atoms, there's quite a large space on that scale. And in between the molecules, there is a large space on that scale also. It's much like being out in space and looking at the solar system. If the sun and each of the planets, if you were to consider them to be molecules, if you could get way down microscopically and look inside your own hand, you would see much the same thing. There are large spaces between them. They're held together by a force or an energy, which we know very little about. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hour of the Time video podcast here on CMRI.tv and also available at our website, which is www.hourofthetime.com. I'd like to remind you that we're almost a month away now from our uh, Hour of the Time Skills and Research Conference to be held in Eager, Arizona. So if you're interested in getting uh, involved in that and coming to attending that conference, please go to our website, once again, www.hourofthetime.com and uh, check out the information on the conference 2007 there. Now, as promised, we're going to continue with Coop, uh, William Cooper's Sedona, Arizona speech, and uh, we'll be doing part two here today, so we hope you enjoy it. Thanks very much for tuning in.
With the proper technology, you could literally put your hand through your other hand if you knew how to do that. The aliens apparently do, because they can not only walk through walls, but they are apparently able to abduct you from your bed in the middle of the night and lift you out through your ceiling without opening any doors, without lifting the roof, without opening any windows, and you pass right through it with no ill effects, and they can put you right back down in your bed in the same manner. Now this sounds totally insane, doesn't it? Doesn't it really? Because I have to tell you, quite frankly, when I was reading this material, and when I was studying the abductee reports, and when I first came across this, I thought it was crazy. I thought it was insane until I realized that it was absolutely real. I want you to also bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that it was not too long ago, and it really wasn't too long ago, that if you mentioned to someone else that in a few years man would be flying through our own atmosphere, you would have been laughed at, ostracized, and probably kicked out of town. Then not long after that, when we did have aircraft and were carrying passengers flew through the air, if you had suggested to your neighbor that in a few years a man would be walking on the moon, you would have been laughed at, ridiculed, and maybe run out of town. Literally, when we put a man on the moon is when I realized that nothing is impossible. Nothing ever again can be impossible. The next most important thing that happened after they found EB it came a few years later. EB became ill and they tried to save him. They were unsuccessful. They didn't know how to go about it. But in an attempt to save him, and also in an attempt to gain favor with this technologically superior race, they began broadcasting out into space for help. We have one of your people here who crashed in one of your ships. We're trying to save his life. He's dying. Please help us save his life. By doing that, they hoped Number one, to make contact. Number two, to make friendly contact. Number three, that the aliens would see us as a benevolent people trying to help one of theirs and would not attempt to destroy us or hurt us. Because we realized that their technology was so far ahead of ours that in any military confrontation of any kind, we would have had no chance whatsoever. <clears throat> and basically that is still true today. What should give you good feelings is that if the aliens wanted to, they could have done anything that they wished to us many, many years ago, and they have not done that. So I see that as good. <laughs> Hopeful. I see it pregnant with all kinds of hope and possibilities for the future. Because we know as the human race, what we usually do to an inferior culture if we're technologically superior is usually not that good. So there is a great deal of hope. There is a great deal of promise in that. E.B. died in June of 1952. As of the time of Eby's death, we had not had any answer to the message that we had sent out into space. The movie that you saw called E.T. is the story of Eby. They have changed some things around to make it more palatable to you. The beginning of the story, he's running around in the desert. He's lost. The government is chasing him. In the real story, the government caught him. In the movie, the little boy gets him and they form this symbiotic relationship. They're each getting something from the other. And it's a wonderful story. Well, in real life, the real life E.B. was assigned an Air Force officer to watch over him, become his friend, get as much information from him as he could. 
be his mentor, be his captor. And the same symbiotic relationship developed between E.B. and this Air Force officer to the point where when E.B. died, the Air Force officer cried. He was deeply hurt. He had lost a dear friend because he had been with E.B. literally night and day since they had found him. In the movie, E.B. gets very ill and everybody's very concerned. And the little boy plays the role of the Air Force officer. And you see that he cries. But in the film, he lives. E.T. Call Home was Project Sigma to attempt to make communications with the aliens to come and help save the life of Evie. The government, ladies and gentlemen, is giving you information at an unprecedented rate every day. They are trying to get to your subconscious and tell you the story of what has happened over the last 44 years. So that when the truth comes out, it is not a critical shock. You will be prepared for it. You will understand what is happening. In 1954, or excuse me, in 1953, we detected large objects in space coming toward the Earth. They took up a high orbit around the equator. These objects were determined to be spacecraft intelligently controlled. We did establish communications with them. Arrangements were made for them to land. There were three landings in 1954. One took place at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. One took place at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The other one, do not hold me to this because I cannot substantiate it, but I believe it was at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. I believe that the aliens who contacted us, who were attempting to help us, who refused to give us technology, who wanted to help us with our spiritual development, I believe that that landing took place at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. But I can't get any verification from that from any source, so don't put that down as fact, put it down as a possibility. The other two bases, the other two landings I know occurred without a doubt at Holloman Air Force Base and Edwards Air Force Base. The first landing occurred at Holloman Air Force Base where the aliens met with our intelligence officers. They reached a basic agreement after several hours. They were able to communicate. They left one hostage with us, his name was Krill, as a pledge that they would return and formalize an agreement. Later in 1954, they landed again at Edwards Air Force Base. President Eisenhower had arranged to be on vacation in Palm Springs. At the appointed date and time, President Eisenhower was whisked away. He actually disappeared. Nobody even saw the helicopter come or go, but he just, he just flat disappeared. The press was really shook up. And if you read the newspapers during that period of time, you will find that the press literally went wild trying to locate him. They were given that he was taken to a dentist for a toothache. They never found a dentist that treated President Eisenhower. In fact, he was at Edwards Air Force Base. He reached a formal agreement with the aliens and a treaty was signed. <coughs> this was played out in a movie that you saw called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Everything that you saw in that movie except for finding the ship in the desert in the plains in Mexico and those types of things was true. People were and are still being abducted. People were and are still being picked up and relocated, decontaminated, brainwashed, given new identities, and put back into society in some other location. It's for their own protection, really. In most cases, in some cases, it's a travesty of justice. People are being implanted. The implants were played out by the silly little tune that people got in their head. That represented the implants. They couldn't get this out of their head. They would have a close encounter with an alien disc and they would hear this tune 
and they could never ever get rid of it. And it drove them to do some crazy things. And there are people today who are being driven to do some crazy things. I know some abductees who wake up one morning after they've had an abduction experience and they've got to move. And they've got to move to a specific place in a specific state and they've got to do it right now. And they don't know why. And they've never been there before. And they have no friends there. They don't even know what the place looks like, but they get all their kids, they pack up, and they leave, and they go to Sedona, Arizona. <laughs> Some of them go to Yelm, Washington. <laughs> there are areas in the United States where people are being driven to. They don't know why they're going to these places, but they're going there. Usually they have been abducted. Usually they have been implanted. Well, let me take that back. I guarantee you that everyone who has been abducted has been implanted. And the time that I saw the information between 1970 and 1973, the official Office of Naval Intelligence figures was 1 in 40, which works out to 2.5% of the population. How did they get these figures? It's very simple, ladies and gentlemen. At that time, they still had the draft. At that time, they had draft quotas from every state representing a certain percentage of the population a certain percentage of the population of young men had to be drafted according to the percentage of the total population that lived in that state. When they came in for induction into the military service, they were given an extensive medical examination and even at that time, ladies and gentlemen, we did have magnetic resonance imaging capability, but the military did not put it out to the civilian community as yet. This was a new technique, a new development. They found that according to the number of implants they found in the military inductees based upon the percentage of the population of that state from which they were taken that the number of people in the United States who had been implanted was one in forty. I sincerely believe that that was an underestimate, maybe a large underestimate, simply because now today most of the abductees are women and that sampling was taken from only men. Why they're mostly women, I don't know. It has something to do, I do know, and this may not be the only reason, and that's why I say I don't know what the whole reason is. It has something to do with the attempts for them to preserve their race in an attempt to crossbreed with human beings. Either as a direct attempt by implanting or impregnating the female and allowing the baby to come to the first trimester at which point they're abducted again and the fetus is removed, or by harvesting sperm and ova from selected human beings and attempting to grow this crossbreed in the laboratory. There is tremendous evidence to support this. Now, let me digress back again to the next major step that happened was that in 1954 when President after President Eisenhower become incumbent with the office, he realized that he was going to have to deal with this and he also realized, as I realized a long time ago, you can't believe what's happening. You can't believe what the aliens tell us, whether they be good, bad, etherical, interdimensional, whatever. There is so much deception and so many lies involved with this that you have to step back 
and say, I'm not going to believe anything until I can prove it. And to do otherwise is to put yourself in terrible jeopardy. Believe me, terrible jeopardy. And I can cite instances where this has happened. President Eisenhower knew that he wasn't capable of determining what the truth was, but he knew that there were some pretty smart people in this country. He put together an organization called MJ-12, or Majority 12. Majority 12 was made up of six men from the United States government. Those six men were Nelson Rockefeller, who represented the president, who was the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of the CIA, the Director of the FBI, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The balance of MJ-12 was made up of the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, it is extremely significant that you understand that the first six members from the government, along with President Eisenhower, were also members and longtime members of the Council on Foreign Relations. They believed in that organization. They believed in its goals, which was one world government. Now, secretly, this was known as Majority 12. It was called MJ-12 in correspondence. When they addressed correspondence to each other, they did not address it to MJ-1 to MJ-6. It was J-1 to J-6, because secretly, they were known as the Jason Scholars amongst themselves. Publicly, they were known as the Committee on the Clear and Present Danger and to my knowledge, may still be known as the Committee on the Present Danger. I remember MJ-12 as being 12 men. However, I am still in the process of remembering, and my memory is constantly being joggled and jiggled. And one of the reasons I may have remembered it as being 12 members on Majority 12 is that they had to have a majority of 12 votes to carry anything into action. Thus Majority 12, thus Operation Majority, thus the Majority Agency for Joint Intelligence. That's where that name really came from. Which means they literally had to have the vote of every member on it if there were really 12 members. But having to have 12 votes to carry, being named Majority 12 or MJ-12, could have just been enough to make me believe that they only had 12 members. My memory is beginning to joggle now, and I'm starting to believe that maybe there was first six from the government and 12 from the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations, and that there may really be 18 members on MJ-12. Whenever I believe that a correction needs to be made, first I wasn't going to do this. But that's wrong not to do that. It's wrong to stick to your guns because you don't want to change anything. That's silly. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't make any difference if there's one member, if there's 12 members, or if there's 18 members. What makes a difference is that Majority 12 exists, MJ-12 exists, these men were all members of the Council on Foreign Relations, and they are the secret government. That's what really counts. Now, I'm telling you this tonight, there may be a discrepancy in the number of members, because I haven't confirmed it yet. But I know that there were at least 12. Everything else that I've told you about them is absolutely true. But there may, may just possibly have been as many as 18. When President Eisenhower put this group together, oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't realize how thirsty I was. When he put this group together, this group, and President Eisenhower may have done this intentionally, but there's no reason to believe that he did, because there's nothing to tell us that he did. But having been a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, he may have done this intentionally. These people saw this as the opportunity that they had been looking for for all of their history. It was the opportunity finally to control 
one of the major superpowers of the world behind the scenes. Because who gets knocked off when things go wrong? The person standing out in front, right? The people behind the scenes just chuckle and laugh and say, ah, they got the wrong guy, and they put another one right up there for you to knock off. If you're even smart enough to knock somebody off, which we haven't been. The only ones that have been knocked off, they did the knocking off. Through a whole bunch of secret executive orders and NSC memos, which are in fact executive orders, they reached the habit actually of using NSC memos in place of presidential executive orders to prevent the government from falling should the public find out what was really going on was to save the presidency. What started out as a means to save the presidency resulted in a means to prevent the president from knowing the truth. Up until President Bush, President Eisenhower was the last president who knew the entire truth. And when he left office, he could see what was happening. He was a very intelligent man. He could not have been the overall commander of all allied forces in Europe with five stars and then reached the office of president uh, if he had been a dummy. He was not Dan Quayle, I can guarantee you. <laughs> he knew what was happening and he attempted to warn us when he left office. He told us quite bluntly and in no uncertain terms to beware of the military industrial complex and who is the military-industrial complex? It is the members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And since the inception of the Trilateral Commission, the Trilateral Commission as well. The Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission control the board of directors, the majority of the stock, and usually the president and CEO of all the major corporations in the United States of America, including the news media, the major publishing interests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Usually the president and CEO is They found that according to the number of implants they found in the military inductees based upon the percentage of the population of that state from which they were taken, that the number of people in the United States who had been implanted was one in 40. I sincerely believe that that was an underestimate, maybe a large underestimate, simply because now today most of the abductees are women and that sampling was taken from only men. Why they're mostly women, I don't know. It has something to do, I do know, and this may not be the only reason, and that's why I say I don't know what the whole reason is. It has something to do with the attempts for them to preserve their race in an attempt to crossbreed with human beings. Either as a direct attempt by implanting or impregnating the female and allowing the baby to come to the first trimester at which point they're abducted again and the fetus is removed, or by harvesting sperm and ova from selected human beings and attempting to grow this crossbreed in the laboratory. There is tremendous evidence to support this. Now, let me digress back again to the next major step that happened was that in 1954, when President after President Eisenhower had become incumbent with the office, he realized that he was going to have to deal with this, and he also realized, as I realized a long time ago, you can't believe what's happening. You can't believe what the aliens tell us, whether they be good, bad, etherical, interdimensional, whatever. There is so much deception and so many lies involved with this. 
that you have to step back and say, I'm not going to believe anything until I can prove it. And to do otherwise is to put yourself in terrible jeopardy. Believe me, terrible jeopardy. And I can cite instances where this has happened. President Eisenhower knew that he wasn't capable of determining what the truth was, but he knew that there were some pretty smart people in this country. He put together an organization called MJ-12, or Majority 12. Majority 12 was made up of six men from the United States government. Those six men were Nelson Rockefeller, who represented the president, who was the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of the CIA, the Director of the FBI, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The balance of MJ-12 was made up of the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, it is extremely significant that you understand that the first six members from the government, along with President Eisenhower, were also members and longtime members of the Council on Foreign Relations. They believed in that organization. They believed in its goals, which was one world government. Now, secretly, this was known as Majority 12. It was called MJ-12 in correspondence. When they addressed correspondence to each other, they did not address it to MJ-1 to MJ-6. It was J-1 to J-6, because secretly they were known as the Jason Scholars amongst themselves. Publicly, they were known as the Committee on the Clear and Present Danger and to my knowledge, may still be known as the Committee on the Present Danger. I remember MJ-12 as being 12 men. However, I am still in the process of remembering, and my memory is constantly being joggled and jiggled. And one of the reasons I may have remembered it as being 12 members on Majority 12 is that they had to have a majority of 12 votes to carry anything into action. Thus Majority 12, thus Operation Majority, thus the Majority Agency for Joint Intelligence. That's where that name really came from. Which means they literally had to have the vote of every member on it if there were really 12 members. But having to have 12 votes to carry, being named Majority 12 or MJ-12, could have just been enough to make me believe that they only had 12 members. My memory is beginning to joggle now, and I'm starting to believe that maybe there was first six from the government and 12 from the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations, and that there may really be 18 members on MJ-12. Whenever I believe that a correction needs to be made, first I wasn't going to do this. But that's wrong not to do that. It's wrong to stick to your guns because you don't want to change anything. That's silly. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't make any difference if there's one member, if there's 12 members, or if there's 18 members. What makes a difference is that Majority 12 exists, MJ-12 exists, these men were all members of the Council on Foreign Relations, and they are the secret government. That's what really counts. Now, I'm telling you this tonight, there may be a discrepancy in the number of members, because I haven't confirmed it yet. But I know that there were at least 12. Everything else that I've told you about them is absolutely true. But there may, may just possibly have been as many as 18. When President Eisenhower put this group together, oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't realize how thirsty I was. When he put this group together, this group, and President Eisenhower may have done this intentionally, but there's no reason to believe that he did, because there's nothing to tell us that he did. But having been a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, he may have done this intentionally. These people saw this as the opportunity that they had been looking for for all of their history. 
It was the opportunity finally to control one of the major superpowers of the world behind the scenes. Because who gets knocked off when things go wrong? The person standing out in front, right? The people behind the scenes just chuckle and laugh and say, ah, they got the wrong guy, and they put another one right up there for you to knock off. If you're even smart enough to knock somebody off, which we haven't been. The only ones that have been knocked off, they did the knocking off. Through a whole bunch of secret executive orders and NSC memos, which are in fact executive orders, they reached the habit actually of using NSC memos in place of presidential executive orders to prevent the government from falling should the public find out what was really going on. It was to save the presidency was started out as a means to save the presidency resulted in a means to prevent the president from knowing the truth. Up until President Bush, President Eisenhower was the last president who knew the entire truth. And when he left office, he could see what was happening. He was a very intelligent man. He could not have been the overall commander of all allied forces in Europe with five stars and then reached the office of president. Uh, if he had been a dummy. He was not Dan Quayle, I can guarantee you. <laughs> he knew what was happening and he attempted to warn us when he left office. He told us, quite bluntly and in no uncertain terms, to beware of the military-industrial complex. And who is the military-industrial complex? It is the members of the Council on Foreign Relations and since the inception of the Trilateral Commission, the Trilateral Commission as well. The Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission control the board of directors, the majority of the stock, and usually the president and CEO of all the major corporations in the United States of America, including the news media, the major publishing interests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Usually the president and CEO is a ask quite appropriately, who the hell are you? <laughs> and I used to start all of my talks out with who I am, where I'm coming from, how I saw this information, and, and what my stance is on it. And I eventually reached a point, and I keep forgetting that I'm not in California anymore. I reached a point where people would say, we already know who you are, tell us what you got to say. So I stopped doing that, but now I'm in Arizona and I, I realize um, that whereas in California I'm very well known, here I may not be as, as well known. I was raised in a military family. My father was an Air Force pilot. He is a retired Air Force colonel at this moment. When I was a child, I heard stories about Foo Fighters and crash disks and things not of this world and strange sights up in the sky and saw pictures that pilots took simply because I was the son of a pilot, not because anybody was taking the time to show me 
I just happened to be there when these things were discussed and when these pictures were shown and passed around. Um, and usually was underfoot and eventually was kicked out and exiled to the back bedroom or the backyard. <clears throat> Eventually, though, I grew up and uh, left home, went into the Air Force. I was assigned to the Strategic Air Command as an aircraft and missile hydraulic technician, which means that I worked on the hydraulics and the pneumatic systems or high-pressure air systems of aircraft and missiles for the Strategic Air Command. I worked with B-52 bombers, uh, KC-135 aircraft, which is the same as a 707, only it's for refueling other aircraft and carries fuel instead of passengers. I worked on B-58 bombers. I worked on Minuteman missiles. During the time, both when I was in school learning my trade in the Air Force and the time that I was on the job, I met people who had taken part in crash disk recoveries and usually at the Airmen's Club or in some bar downtown or someplace because I was a young man then and that's where you could usually find me with a beer in my hand looking for a girl and if there wasn't a girl around we lied to each other <laughs> a lot and generally these stories I thought to be a lie until later years when I realized that these guys had been telling me the truth and I could kick myself in the head because I had not written it down I had not pressed them for more information at a time when they were willing to talk to me for some reason or other. When I left the Air Force, I went into the Navy, and uh, really I had planned to just skip from service to service. I was a pretty crazy young kid. I was gung-ho. I was raised in uh, John Wayne movies and Sergeant Rock comic books. I came from a military family. My whole family was in the military service. Uh, uncles, grandfathers, brother, everybody. Um, we were service people. We were government people. We were patriots. We cared. We believed that the, the best thing that a man or a woman could do was to serve their country. When I went in the Navy, I volunteered for submarines because that was the weirdest thing you could do. <laughs> and I was pretty weird. And I thought it would be neat to sleep underwater. <laughs> so I did. While I was on submarines, being junior in the Navy, real junior, I had to stand lookout watches. Lookouts are well-trained professional observers. They are not just someone that they grab out of the galley and stick it there with a pair of binoculars. You are well trained because before you yell to the officer of the deck that you got to shoot at something coming at you off the port beam, you got to know that that's really the enemy and not the admiral coming out for a visit. <laughs> and that's really the main reason for it. <laughs> So we were trained observers. Now this is extremely important to me personally because without this experience I probably would not have lent the importance that the later information that I was going to see, I probably would not have realized how important it was. While on lookout between the Portland, Seattle area and the Pearl Harbor area, while we were traveling on the surface as port lookout, I saw a craft the size of an aircraft carrier exit the water at a range of approximately two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter. The port quarter is approximately 45 relative degrees off the port bow. Port is your left. Left port wine is red. That's where the red light is on a ship. Okay, now we got through that. <laughs> I was stunned. I knew that I had just seen something that was absolutely incredible and nobody in the world would believe that I saw it and nobody else saw it. And I was faced with a dilemma. I'm the port lookout. Something just came up out of the water that could destroy us in a second. It was a machine. It was intelligently guided. I knew this. It was as big as an aircraft carrier. It was the most 
important, earth-shattering thing that had ever happened to me in my life because I saw it, I realized what it was, I knew I wasn't dreaming, there was nobody around who could be manipulating me in any way, shape, or form, and it was my responsibility to report this. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to tell the man who writes my performance report that I just saw this thing come out of the water? You've got to be nuts. But I had a responsibility to the safety of the ship, the boat, which we call submarines, boats, not ships, to the boat and to the crew. So I had to devise a method to report this. And what I did was that I told the officer of the deck, Ensign Ball, I said, Ensign Ball, I saw something about two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter, but it just flashed and I don't know what it was. Could you please help me scour that area? to see if we can find it again. Now, I didn't really believe that this thing was going to show up again at all. Well, the starboard lookout heard this conversation, and he turned around and started looking too, which he shouldn't have done, because you're never supposed to desert your own field of responsibility, but he did. At about that time, the object came, or this object, or another one just like it, came back down out of the clouds and entered the water. Ensign Ball dropped his binoculars, dropped his jaw, and turned around and just stared at me and didn't say a word. And then he turned back around and he just stared off into space for a couple of minutes. And then he turned around and looked at me again. And he said, this had to happen on my watch. <laughs> He then called the captain to the bridge, which on any naval vessel means that there is an emergency in progress. You do not call the captain to the bridge unless there is an emergency situation, unless his presence is needed. If you call the captain to the bridge and his presence is not needed, you are in deep, deep, <laughs> deeper than the submarine will dive to trouble. <laughs> And it's lucky they didn't have submarines in the old Navy when they killed people. <laughs> now, the captain came to the bridge, and so did the chief quartermaster, because it was his job to come to the bridge with the captain with a 35 millimeter camera any time anything like this happened. This event repeated itself several times over a seven to 10 minute period, and we watched it. They would exit the water, go and disappear in the clouds, and then another ship, or the same ship, would re-enter the water. Eventually, it stopped. We were told by the captain before we left the con, the bridge, not to discuss it with the other crew members, that it was classified top secret, and that we were never to mention it to anyone. Now, the crew knew about it. How they knew about it, I don't know, but I suspect that it was picked up on sonar and radar also, in which case the sonar men and the radar men would know about it too. And I believe that is what has happened, and I believe that they were also told not to talk to anyone. But several crew members came up to me and wanted to know if we really saw a UFO, and I told them uh, that I was not allowed to discuss what happened, uh, and I didn't know what I saw anyway. So that was the end of that. Uh, I did tell a good friend about it years later. When we arrived in Pearl Harbor, a officer from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and debriefed each one of us independently of the others. I do not know what went on in the debriefings of the other personnel involved, but when I went in, he began to ask me <coughs> what I saw.
so that was the end of that. Uh, I did tell a good friend about it years later. When we arrived in Pearl Harbor, a officer from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and debriefed each one of us independently of the others. I do not know what went on in the debriefings of the other personnel involved, but when I went in, he began to ask me <coughs> what I saw. When I began to describe to him what I saw, he became very upset, even enraged. And having come from a military family, having a father who was an Air Force pilot and an officer, having served four years in the Air Force, I knew what this man wanted to hear it was obvious to me. So I told him what he wanted to hear so that I didn't have to go through with what I knew I would have to go through if I told him anything else. So I told him, sir, I did not see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, that's the spirit. <laughs> I had to sign a security oath. I was dismissed, told that I was a good sailor, had a good future with the Navy, and I left. On the way out, Seaman DiGiralamo was braced up against the bulkhead in the passageway, and I whispered to him, tell him you didn't say anything. And I don't know whether he did or not, because we never talked about it again amongst ourselves. Several years later, I was trained again. Well, in between this, I struck, or striking is what you call trying out for a certain particular job. I was striking for quartermaster, which is navigation. Uh, it's where you navigate whatever ship or vessel you're on. Uh, I made it, was promoted to third class quartermaster. Uh, eventually was promoted to second class quartermaster. I was then trained by naval intelligence in my secondary NEC, which is 9545, which is internal security. I was then sent to Vietnam where I was given a multi-million dollar patrol boat. I was given five other lives to take care of and mother and be a friend to and be a daddy to and everything else and was given a river and everybody that lived on both sides of that river and said, Bill, go out and kick their butt.